Hello, Cliffy here from Cliff Dive into Movies. Let's talk about Quest for Fire. Released in 1981, Quest for Fire is a French-Canadian production. Originally, it was going to be a French-American production. 20th Century Fox was going to be the American studio. They did end up releasing it. But the director, Jean-Jacques Eno, had to go to Canada because there was an actor strike in 1980. Apparently, it was a pretty big strike, and it caused a lot of delays, so they had to go to Canada. Um, the director had a hard time getting people to be interested in this movie because they thought um, a movie where it was about cavemen who don't speak any known language, the cavemen aren't exactly attractive, they didn't think it would do very well, and they thought it would be a bomb. Uh, to put it mildly, they were wrong. The movie was very well received and ended up with a budget equivalent to 12 million U.S. dollars and made 55 million in uh, U.S. dollars at the American box office alone. Uh, in 2024, that would be about 40 million dollar budget and a 185 million dollar take. Nowadays, studios make movies for 200 million and are lucky to get 50 million. Now, the funny thing nowadays is you ask anybody about do you. Have they ever seen Quest for Fire? And a lot of times they'll say, no, um, isn't that the one with the cavemen? And then be kind of dismissive about it. But in truth, it's actually a pretty good movie. And it's one of my favorite movies. Currently, Rotten Tomatoes gives it a 88% on the tomato meter with 75% audience score. Cisco and Ebert liked it when it came out. And if you grew up in the 80s like I did, you always considered their opinion on movies to be very important. You actually care about the characters. And despite them not talking in primitive language, all the characters have personality. And, and you generally care about them. A lot of time was spent in pre-production and in creating the world. A year and a half was spent on creating both the language of the main tribe, the Ulam, and developing and teaching the principal actors on how to act more primitive. In the end, the language of the Ulam ended up having 160 words. The most important one is, of course, Atra, which is fire. The language was created by the author Anthony Burgess. He's the guy that wrote A Clockwork Orange. Anthropologist Desmond Morris, author of The Naked Ape, worked with various minds to develop the movements the actors would use. The actors had to learn how to act more primitive, more chimp-like, walk differently, change the center of their gravity, squat with their feet flat, and hold things without using their thumbs too much. Quest for Fire starts 80,000 years ago with the Ulam tribe sleeping in their cave when they get attacked one morning by the Wagabu, who have come to take the U Ulam's fire and women. The Ulam escape into a marsh. But during the escape, the man responsible for the fire accidentally drops it into the water. Although the Ulam have fire, they don't know how to make it. Therefore, three men are sent out on a quest for fire. At the start of the journey, they get chased by two saber-toothed cats, which results in them taking refuge in a tree. This is one of the standout scenes of the movie. After that, they come across a primitive cannibal tribe called the Kazam. The Kazam have captured a woman called Aika. The group take the Kazam's fire, and Aika is freed. Later, the Kazam come to get their fire back and are chased away by a group of mammoths. Aika decides to travel with the group until she decides to go back to her own people. The leader of the group, Noah, decides to go after her and gets captured by Aika's people. Aika's people are called the Ivaka. The Ivaka chief decides to mate Noah with a lot of the women of the tribe. They happen to be the larger women, which means the slender Aika is not part of this. And of course, this upsets her. The other two guys in the group come along and they rescue Noah with the help of Aika and then they journey back to the Ulam tribe. On the way back to the tribe, a party member gets attacked by a bear. This is another big scene in the movie. Just before the group makes it back, three members of the Ulam tribe attack them so that they can come back with the fire and take the credit. Okay, I have to be honest. Despite the fact that I make a lot of videos called 10 Things That I Noticed, in all the time that I've watched this movie, I never noticed until making scream caps for this video that the leader of these three guys is the same guy that got the heroes sent out to look for fire in the beginning of the movie. The group finally makes it back to the marsh that the Ulam are still at, but in the excitement, the same guy who put the fire out earlier in the movie accidentally puts the fire out again. And as a side note, the actor who plays this guy, Gary Schwartz, is one of the minds who helped develop the movements the actors make in order to be more primitive. If you pay close attention, there are fewer Elam tribe members at the end of the movie than at the beginning. It looks like while waiting for the group to come back, some of the tribe members have died. Um, in fact, in truth, the day this um, scene was filmed to save money, one of the producers sent some cast members home early so that they didn't have to pay them for a full day and they didn't have to buy them lunch. 
Unfortunately, that producer didn't realize that they still needed to film scenes after lunch with the group. The most primitive tribe seen are the Wagaboo, an ape-like people. In the making of program and the behind-the-scenes material on the DVD, they are referred to as Neanderthals. I'm not sure if the filmmakers were taking liberties or if this is what people thought Neanderthals looked like in 1982. Nowadays, they are thought to be more of a stockier and hairier version of modern man. The suits used for the Wagaboo took two months to make and were made out of yak hair. The main tribe in the movie is the Ulam. The makeup for the principal actors consisted of five appliances for the faces and three pieces for the wig, and they also had to wear dentures. This makeup got Sarah Monzani and Michelle Burke Academy Awards for Best Makeup. To make it look authentic, the actors were not allowed to wear footwear when on camera, even if you don't see their feet, although... Uh, Ray Don Chong was allowed to wear sandals a few times. A few things make the Ulam unique as far as movie came and go. Um, first, the complete lack of footwear. Usually came in have big fur boots. Second, the furs look like skins that have just have holes in them and are draped over the bodies, not form-fit in bikinis. Or shorts, and third, the ulam are extremely dirty. Usually, K people in movies are rather well bathed for being so primitive. The Kazam are a tribe of rather large primitive cannibals. These were all played by wrestlers wearing full face masks. Not sure if this is based on a real group of ancient people or not, but the movie Adam and Eve vs. the Cannibals borrowed this look for their cannibals. The Avanka tribe is the most advanced tribe. They have pottery, shelter, weapons, clothing, and alcohol of some sort. Instead of creating a language for them, the director brought in Inuit Indians to record dialogue for the Avanka tribe language. Proof that people are the same all over the world. When the Inuit actors realized the director didn't know what they were saying, they took the opportunity to use rather foul language and make dialogue that had nothing to do with the movie. Apparently their version of the movie is rather funny, at least to them. The movie was shot in three countries, Canada, Scotland, and Kenya. The Ulam Cave, Marshlands, and Forests were shot in Canada. The scenes with the elephants and the saber-toothed cats were filmed in Scotland, and the Kazam and Avanka tribe scenes were filmed in Kenya. It was planned to film the mammoth scenes in Iceland. However, production delays, bureaucratic problems with bringing elephants into Iceland. Apparently, they're not too keen on bringing any four-legged animals, let alone elephants, into the country. And a volcano created too many problems to the filmmakers that it just wasn't possible to film there. When it comes to the scenery, there are no matte paintings or special effects. What you see, what they saw is what they filmed. All of the scenery you see is real. Even the times you see fire in the distance, it's just a man with a gas can and a match. The saber-toothed cats were actually lion-tiger hybrids with fangs glued to their teeth. And finally, we all either have a job we hate or have had a job that we hate, but our jobs could be worse. The next time you think your job is bad, just think of this. Ron Perlman and Everett McGill both got, both got frostbite. All the actors had to walk barefoot on frozen soil, hot soil, rocky soil, volcanic soil, and soil with thorns. Ray Don Chong has mentioned many times that she got huge thorns in her feet. The person who collected the untreated furs for the huts contracted anthrax. And the person who was sent to cast the voluptuous women in the Ivanka tribe spent three weeks in jail because the local authorities thought he was trafficking in large women. So what do you think of Quest for Fire? Personally, it's one of my favorite films and I always like it. It's a very good film, very entertaining. Uh, write in the comments what you think of the film. Thanks for watching. I've enjoyed making this video and take care.